That about covers it. So, how are you going to take down all those soldiers? Going to bat your eyes at them and say, Please don't hurt me, I'm a pathetic whore. Wait a minute. How could your sister have done anything to do with what happened between Trotsden and the Annihilators? When I talked to Javelin about this, she said it was a stallion from Trotsden and a mare from the Annihilators. I asked. Rusty looked a little confused by this. Well, I know that Javelin wasn't the leader of the Annihilators at the time. It was a mare named High Strike. It's possible the information got confused or told wrong. I'm not sure. But no, this all happened because of my sister. After we left Stable 9 and we found Stable 38, it was abandoned, so we took refuge in it. Not long after, a few ponies from the Annihilators found us. We talked with their leader at the time, and she said we could use it for as long as we wanted, as long as we let them take what they needed from the stable first. They'd been using it as a place to keep excess storage. We agreed and spent the next few years inside the stable. Eventually, we figured out we'd have to venture out of the stable, because it wasn't suited for ponies to live in for a long time anymore. We started to strip the stable down, and use what we could to build what became Trotsden. Why wasn't Stable 34 suited for ponies anymore? I thought the stables could keep ponies alive for hundreds of years, I asked. Well, sure, but something forced the Annihilators to leave. We never found out what it was. Most of the terminals in there had their hard drives wiped or were destroyed. Stable 34 was abandoned for 30 years. It was extremely run down. We tried to fix what we could, but simply, it was an uphill battle with no end. So instead, we started to build our city, and I was put in charge. Back then, Trotsden was quite friendly with the Annihilators. We were the only settlement that traded with them and were allowed to meet with them, Rusty said. Let me guess. Your sister did something to anger them? Aura asked. Bite got up, kicked her chair over, and walked away in a huff. I watched her go, then asked, What's her problem? Cookie doesn't like this story. She wasn't even born yet when all this happened, but it puts her mother in a bad light, and she really liked her mom. Rusty said with a sigh. Wingnut, would you mind going with her? You might be able to help calm her down. Wingnut looked up at Rusty as if he'd just asked the colt to jump into a puddle of taint. What the hell? Why me? Because she likes you, kid. Just go and be a gentle colt for a change. I said, doing my best to hide my smile. She doesn't like me. She keeps calling me a bug. He protested. I'd feel better if someone goes to make sure she's okay. Rusty said. He jumped off his chair, looking just as frustrated as Bite did a moment ago. Fine, but I'm only doing it because I'm nice. Yeah, you keep telling yourself that, Aura said, snickering as Wingnut followed the angry filly. Rusty looked back at us and continued. So, as I was saying, you remember when I told you that my sister hated staying in town? She loved to go out into the Wasteland and explore. She also used to get into a lot of trouble with the Wastelanders. Yeah, I remember something you saying about that before, I said. Well, that's how she met Cherry Bomb, Cookie's father. I don't know everything that happened between those two, but one thing led to another, and my sister ended up pregnant with Cookie. Cherry Bomb wasn't very happy about this, and they got into a fight. At least, that's how my sister described it. She ended up killing him. To make it worse, she left his body in front of the gate where the Annihilators were. You mean this whole thing started over a bad romance and one dead body? I asked. I wish it was for that. For one, Cherry Bomb was the son of High Strike. She sent some of her ponies to Trotsden to demand that we give them my sister to stand trial for her crime. I didn't let them have her. They also wanted me to give them Cookie when she was born, as they considered her an Annihilator because her father was one. I refused that as well, saying that we weren't going to let them kill my sister for defending herself against a stallion who didn't want her to have his foal. Things just kept going downhill from there. How could things get worse? When Thrasher asked. Rusty sighed deeper, taking a moment 
to take a long drink. We were <clears throat> building our wall at the time. They kept trying to kill our ponies as we built it. We had to hire guards just to finish the project. They saw our refusal to give them Cookie and my sister as an act of betrayal for them letting us use Stable 34. A year after Cookie was born, High Strike tried to tell us that we had no right to keep using Stable 34 and told us that we had to give them back the stable. We couldn't do that even if we wanted to. We'd almost stripped the stable by then. So they kept on trying to attack us, and we fought back, only to defend ourselves. They had their last straw twelve years ago when Pride killed my sister. I don't know how, but somehow High Strike found out that she died, and again demanded that we give them cookies since she was her grandmother, and felt she needed to be with her father's family, since both her parents were dead. I can see where this is going, Stardust said. After all the attacks, you weren't going to just let them take your niece away from you. And that's about right. I'd already taken Cookie by this point, and I wasn't going to lose the last of my family to these nutjobs. Every day, I looked at her to see so much potential in that filly. I'm glad I took her in, because I shudder to think what would have happened if she lived on that base. She'd be stuck with more rules than she had in Trotston, and Cookie is so much like her mother. She doesn't do well with boundaries and rules. She would have been miserable living there, with no tech to play with and stuck behind a fence guarding against no pony. Even though what you did caused a small war between both settlements? When Thresher asked. He looked over at her with a smile. Yes, Wind Thresher. I lost so much that I couldn't bear the thought of losing more. I'd lost your mother, Wind Thrasher, when Dr. Sell killed her. I lost you to his madness. I lost my home because of what happened in Stable Nine. I lost my only remaining family when Pride killed my sister. I wasn't going to lose Cookie as well. The thing I'm wondering is how are we going to get both of your towns to forget the past and work towards a better future? Rusty chuckled a little. Honestly, I don't give a fuck about the Annihilators. What I really want for them to do is leave us alone. It's been so many years since this all started, and still, whenever my ponies go out to trade, they get attacked by long-ranged missiles from the Annihilators, or by the rare scouting party they send out from time to time. I'd rather find some agreement that will let them just leave us alone. Maybe that can happen. It all depends upon what Javelin wants, I said as the mayor from the bar came over towards us. Can I get you all something to drink? She asked with a cute voice. Sunrise sarsaparilla for me, please, if you have it. I said, remembering that interesting drink I had back in Hidden Sands. Some apple buck rum for me, Stardust said. Top shelf. Water's fine for me, as long as it's clean, Horace said, sounding bored. Rock a cola for me, please. Wind Thrasher said shyly. I'm fine with what I have, Rusty said with a sigh. No problem, dears. I'll be right back, the bar mare said as she walked away. It only took a minute for the mare to come back with our drinks. We paid and the others started to drink. I pulled the bottle of Sunset's Rasparilla closer and twisted the bottle cap off. Like the last bottle I got, this one also had a blue star under the cap. That's strange. What's strange? Aura asked, looking over at me. Showing her the bottle cap, I said, The last time I got one of these, it also had a blue star under the cap. I guess it's some kind of signature of theirs? Though it's strange that they'd put it where no pony could see it until after you opened the bottle. Aura's eyes went wide. You're kidding, right? Two blue star bottle caps? You're some kind of lucky mare, Shadow. I've only found four in the six years I've been looking for them, and only one was on a bottle. The other three I got off some raiders I killed. And what's so special about them? I asked. I mean, it's just a cap, isn't it? Not those caps. There are ponies out there who would kill you just for one of them, Laura said. What's the big deal about blue stars on caps? Winthrasher asked. Rusty was the one who answered. There's some sort of legend about those caps. 
Aura laughed. <laughs> it's not a legend, Rusty. I've been to the Sunrise Sarsaparilla factory. And there's this robotic... Aura rotated her talons as if trying to remember. Something at the entrance. He told me himself that if I give him 50 of those caps, I'll get the treasure. Be that as it may, you still don't know exactly what kind of treasure it is now, do you? Rusty said, chuckling. Wait, there is a treasure in that old factory? Stardust said, sounding excited. That's what the story says. Aura answered. Using my pip buck, I checked to see if I still had the one from before. With my luck, I most likely spent it like any other cap. But the Mark II seemed to know it was special because it listed it as a different part of my saddlebags. I pulled it out, saying, Well, you can have it if you want, Aura. I'm not interested in treasure. Stardust looked over at me like I said something stupid. Not interested in treasure? Are you insane? There could be enough loot to buy you this trip. I doubt that. It was probably some publicity stunt the company was trying to use so they could compete with Sparkle Cola. I said, sliding the cap over to Aura, who took them happily. I agree, Shadow. But I still want to see what it is. Aura said as she tucked the cap into a small pouch she pulled from her saddlebags. What if it's a load of loot we could sell and make a shit ton of caps from? He asked. Aura winked at me, then said to Stardust, Then Shadow and I will have a nice place on the strip to call home. What about me? He asked. Depends on how much you annoy me, she said with a chuckle. A place on the strip sounds like a nice place to settle down, though I don't think you'll ever have enough for something like that, Windthrasher said. Don't worry, Windthrasher, you'll always have a room wherever we live, I said. Oh, so Windthrasher has a place to live no matter what, but I have to stay on your good side, Stardust said, sulking. I never said that. That was Aura. But if she's the one who makes it big with some treasure she got from an old factory, then it's up to her, not me, I said with a laugh. We all had a good long laugh the expression on Stardust's face. After a little while, he joined in, and we spent the next half hour talking about the things we would do with the Mountain of Caps. That was until Rusty pointed out that Mr. Tops probably had most of the caps in New Pegasus and wouldn't take kindly to a group of ponies having more than he does. After that, we all quieted down for a bit until Rusty said, Wingnut and Cookie have been gone for a little while now. I'm starting to get worried. I should go and check on them. No, I'll go. I'd like to look around a little before this meeting starts so I can see where they went. I said, I'll come with you. I really shouldn't let Wingnut stay out of my sight for too long anyway. Nora said, getting up. Don't worry about Wingnut. I'll find him, I said, giving her a quick kiss on the cheek before heading off towards where Bite and Wingnut had run off to. Nora didn't argue. She just shrugged and sat back down as I walked off. Crossroads Trading Post wasn't that big of a place, but it was amazing how many little shops ponies had managed to set up. Every few feet I met ponies who were trying to get me to come look at their stands, or brandish specialty merchandise in my face. I did my best to ignore them as I trotted by. I'd have time later to look at the shops and restock on supplies. I'd just crossed the overpass and walked down that ramp that led to a lower level when I saw them. Wingnut was sitting next to Bite at the end of the ramp, talking quietly. From the sound of it, your mom wasn't a bad mare. Bite sniffed. She wasn't. But she did have a temper, and she got her a lot of trouble. I mean, no pony knows why she really killed my dad. She said it was self-defense, but I don't know. What if the Annihilators are still angry about what she did? I don't think it'll be big as a deal as you think, Bite. I mean, Javelin's a nice mare, and from what the others told me there, uh, she's way easier to deal with than the mare who ran things before her. Wingnut said. Huh, I guess he can talk like a gentle colt sometimes. For a pony who said he didn't like Bite, he was being really nice to her. Bite sniffed again. Don't you dare tell any pony I was crying. He laughed. Don't worry. I'll keep it between the two of us. I remember what I was like when I 
first went to Little Hoof after my parents died. I used to get teased a lot by the older foals because I'd cry myself to sleep. I slowly moved back from the ramp and hid behind some rubble so I could keep listening. As I did, I heard Bite say, So, what happened to your parents? Yeah, I'm not really sure. Something that looked made out of darkness attacked us in a cave. Dad told me to run while he and Mom tried to fight it off. They didn't make it, he said. And that's why you're afraid of the dark? She asked. Yeah, I just always have a feeling that the thing could kill me. It's going to come back. I know, it's stupid, but I can't help it. No, I get it, Wingnut. Now I feel kind of bad for teasing you back at my house, Bite said. Yeah, it's okay. You didn't know. I just overreacted. You know, you're not as bad as I thought you were. An air of offense came over her voice. What's that supposed to mean? Wingnut chuckled. Well, you were kind of a bitch when we first met you, and you did call me a bug. Multiple times. She laughed, too. Well, you are a bug, but that isn't such a bad thing. What do you mean it's not a bad thing? Wingnut asked, but Bite laughed again. Hey, let's get back. I'm sure Rusty is starting to get worried. I peeked around the rubble and saw that Bite had gotten back to her hooves. Before Wingnut could do or say anything else, she kissed his cheek and ran off, a bright red blush on her face. Hurry up, you stupid bug! Wingnut watched her for a moment, rubbing his cheek, smiling slightly, then got to his hooves and followed, blushing even worse than he had before. Hey! Wait up for me! What did you mean? I watched him run by chasing after the giggling filly. I was about to follow them when I heard Aura say from behind me, You know, he's kinda cute when he's acting his own age. Tripping over my own hooves and falling to the ground, my heart feeling like it had just been jumped into my throat, from shock of Aura showing up, I said, Why do all my friends want to scare me to death? Hmm, maybe it's because it's funny as hell to watch you jump, she said with a quick laugh, holding a talon down to help me up. Why were you spying on shrimp number two and little miss bitch face? I wasn't spying, I was just walking and saw them talking. I couldn't help myself. Yeah, I'm sure you could have. You just wanted to see what was going on between those two. I just wanted to make sure she doesn't do something to break his heart. She smiled. Yeah, I'm sure that's all it was. Oh, stop looking at me like you know everything. I'm just looking out for him. It's not fun to get your heart broken. I said, frowning up at her. Jado, that's part of growing up. I've had my heart broken more than once, and I'm sure you have as well. It sucks, but we learn from things like that. It's also possible that Cookie Bite really does like Wingnut. Did you think about that? I mean, I guess I did, but how would I know? I was so lost on what to do, I couldn't stand it if something happened to him. Yeah, it's funny to tease him about him liking Bite, or vice versa, but I don't want him to get hurt. It isn't up to you to know or not. I know you care about him, Shadow, but this is something Wingnut has to do on his own. If he wants to get to know her better and they end up together, that's for him to decide, not you. You're not his mom or his big sister. Even if you were, telling him what to do will only make things worse. You only step in to help him if he comes and asks for it. Got it? She said, putting a talon on my shoulder. You think you can do that? Yeah, I guess. And then don't go sneaking around everywhere eavesdropping on him anymore. If he needs us, he'll find us. I smiled. Why are you so smart? She punched my foreleg with a grin. I'm not smart, Shadow. I've seen a thing or two, so I know a thing or two. Now come on. The Red Talons are just getting here, and we should get ready for this meeting. Lead the way, I said, bumping her rear with my own. I was being tutored by Eris Greenhaven, the griffin who had helped us with Stable 28, and was once involved with Aura. 
Okay, one more time. Tell me what you say when one of them starts to shout. Eris said. She'd arrived three hours ago with five other griffins from the Red Talons. Eris will be sitting with me as I helped with the negotiations between the Annihilators and Trotston. Since she arrived, she's been tutoring me on how to be a good negotiator. So far, I wasn't doing well. Uh, don't start shouting or I'll kick you in the face? I asked. She slammed her face down on the table. You're impossible, you know that? The right response in a situation where one side starts yelling at another is to calmly say something like, I understand that you're upset, but shouting will not fix the problems between your two. Now can we please try this again and keep this conversation on the civil side? You see, if you start yelling at one of them, it will only make things worse. You're supposed to be the griff- I mean pony who isn't picking sides. You're the one they're going to look to, so they can see if they're being offered good terms or not. This is also stupid. Why can't Rusty just say he's sorry for what his sister did, but she's dead now? Why bother fighting over old wrongs, especially when you didn't even do anything? I said with a huff. If life worked that way, Shadow, the world would be so much easier. Eris said, leaning back in her seat. Okay, let's try it again. If one side starts to threaten another, what do you do? It took a moment to think. My first response wasn't going to work, that I knew. I mean, pointing my own gun at said offender and threatening to blow their heads off wasn't going to help. So, what do I say? Looking back at her, I replied, Violence is how you both got here in the first place? You wanted to talk this out so both of your towns could live in peace with each other? Let's sit back down and try this again. I was waiting for the rebuke, but it didn't come. When I looked back at Eris, she looked shocked. Damn, that's a good one. How'd you come up with that? I shrugged. I knew my first thought wouldn't be the right one, so I thought to myself, what would Vervain do? She's always good at breaking up conflicts in the stable. She laughed. See, that's what you need to do. Don't try and ask yourself what you should say. Ask yourself what Vervain would say. Wasn't she the mare who raised you? The one who was a steel ranger hiding in that old stable? Yeah, she was our administrator. Mostly a fancy word for the stable's watchdog. Kind of like Apollo, then. Eris said, mostly to herself. What do you mean? I thought Apollo was one of the leaders of the Red Talons. She frowned a little. He is, but really the only leader is Gillian. She has the final say on everything. Apollo mostly takes care of problems some of the Griffins have with each other. The day-to-day -day activities and deals with our bigger contracts. Bigger contracts like the Strip, Freedom Town, New Appleton, Las Alicorn, the Steel Rangers, and so on. Wait, what's New Appleton? I asked. Oh, right. You've been gone for a while. The ponies who survived Appleton's fall moved into Stable 14, the old Griffin Stable. They're calling it New Appleton now and running it like an inner town, kind of like Trotston used to do with Stable 34 before the walls and buildings went up, she said, almost like an afterthought. What about Tonto? I asked. She laughed. Tonto is there to give advice to Apollo or Gillian, if they need it. He's wise and kind, but also a very good tactician. Really? From what I've heard from Aura about him, I thought he was just a dirty old hermit griffin who told jokes, stories, and a bunch of books in his cave. Well, he's also that, she said with another laugh. Anyway, let's try another. For another hour, she ran me through some more techniques. When she was finally done, I think she was feeling a little better about letting me do this. At least she didn't slam her head on the table after the last four answers I gave, though that has to be some kind of improvement. It was finally time for the meeting between the Annihilators and Trotston to begin. The Red Talon set up a table just outside of Crossroads Trading Post. Three Griffins stood guard on each side of the table, each giving the table space so two leaders could talk without feeling like Griffins were looming over them. A couple more Griffins were flying around keeping an eye out for any incoming danger. Rusty was already sitting at one end of the table. 
Bite sitting next to him, looking bored. Eris was sitting next to me. She was there to help me with the negotiations if I needed it. Javelin was already just arriving. She'd only brought four ponies with her as guards, one of which was her granddaughter, Smokescreen. As they all walked closer to where we sat, waiting, one of the griffins moved to block her way. Lifting a spear, but not pointing it at them, he said, Welcome to Crossroads Trading Post. I assume you're Javelin. The old mare nodded. Yes, of course. Could you step aside so we can start? I'm sorry, ma'am. But the contract states you set up only the leader of each town and one representative at the table. Your guards can stay with us while you talk, the griffin said. Javelin smiled a little. I remember my own terms. My granddaughter will be my representative. The other two are just here to make sure I make the trip without any problems. I'm not exactly as young as the man I was before. Very well. I'll also need to ask you to give me your weapons before you pass. You can't expect us to, Smokescreen started to say, but a look from Javelin shut her up. That was also part of the term, Smokescreen. Now leave your battle saddle with rockets so we can start, Javelin said. Yes, ma'am. Smokescreen said, sounding disappointed when she removed her battle saddle, giving it to one of the other ponies. When that was both done, they walked over and sat at the opposite side of the table from Rusty. He nodded to them both, saying, Looks like you made a trip here without any problems. Most ponies around here know to stay away from the Annihilators, Rusty. We don't expect to have much difficulty. Javelin said. Eris nudged me. Looking over at her, I saw her nod her head towards the two, indicating that I was supposed to say something. I cleared my throat. It's nice to see you again, Javelin and Smokescreen. Since you are the one who set this up, I'll let you start. Javelin looked over towards Rusty, saying, Rusty Shackles. It's been many years since we last saw each other. That it has, Javelin. So tell me, what did you want to meet? Duh, she wants us to give back her stupid stable, Bite said. Before Rusty could say something to his niece, Javelin started to laugh softly. <laughs> you must be Cookie Bite. I was told that you were a bit of a hoofful. She stuck her tongue out at Javelin. Damn right. And we aren't giving you back Stable 34. It wouldn't be worth it to you anyway. It's almost nothing left of it inside. Javelin shook her head. I didn't set this all up for an old stable. Honestly, I'd be happy to never step hoof in that place again. Rusty sighed. Then what do you want? The last leader of your ponies demanded that I give my niece and sister after what happened 15 years ago. If that's what you want, then you wasted your time coming here, because I'm not going to do that. Smokescreen spoke this time. We don't want that either. Javelin doesn't care what our last leader wanted. She's risking her position and her life to make peace, you stupid asshole. Javelin looked at her granddaughter. Smokescreen, I can handle this. She looked back at Rusty. Rusty, you may remember what it was like back in the day when our two towns worked together before this misunderstanding broke out between our towns. I do. Your ponies helped us a lot when we were first set up in Trotston. Back then, life was easy for both towns because we worked together to build a better life for all of our ponies. Rusty said. She nodded. That's right. I'd like to work something out to bring us back to that. You see, I don't care what happened between your sister or her lover, Cherry Bomb. From what I've seen and been able to learn over the last few months, I believe the story your sister gave to why she killed one of our own may not have been fully true, but it was close enough. Bite spoke up again. That pony who fathered me tried to kill my mom, just because they got into a fight. Javelin looked at Bite, saying, That part I do believe, uh, but it was your mother who started it. We found evidence, which I will give to you once we're done, showing that she broke into the base to see your father, Cookie Bite. She caught him with another mare, and she started the fight. You can't say it's her fault, Bite yelled. Bite, let her speak. You can talk once she's done, I said. Bite looked like she wanted to say something next to me, but when Rusty glared at her, she shut up too. 
Javelin waited, then said, I'm not saying that it's all on her. What your father did was wrong, and your mom had every right to get angry. The problem was she tried to attack the other mare. When she was stopped, she got mad and left your father after her. I believe that he did attack her once she was on her way back to Trotston because of what she tried to do to this other mare. So yes, she did defend herself. But she is also the one who started the whole thing because of her temper. A temper of which you seem to have inherited? Rusty chuckled at that. You have no idea. Still, what does this have to do with what we are doing now? Nothing. I just wanted you to know what we found out. This other mare finally gave me the whole story from her side a few weeks ago. I just wanted you to know the truth, and as I said, I have the evidence for you that you can look over later. My point is that this all happened in the past, and has hurt both of our towns. Trotston has flourished over the past fifteen years, even with having to deal with the Annihilators. Even though you keep your city locked down, much like you do, you still work with the Wasteland Ponies to keep your town running. We have tried to do this as well, but thanks to the reputation we brandishes, it's been hard gathering supplies to keep our town going. I called this meeting so that I could save my ponies from dying. Rusty looked thoughtful at that. So you need Trostin's help to keep your ponies from dying out. That's right. Since we don't let any pony join us, we are going to be in danger of inbreeding soon. It was a problem we were facing in the stable as well. But we didn't do anything to fix it when we left. We have to change our way of life soon. And the first step in this is setting up trade with Trotston and forgetting our wrongs of the past so we can start over. Honestly, I just really want your ponies to leave us be. I can understand where you're coming from, but I don't see how helping you will help us apart from stopping the attacks. Rusty said. I thought that the attack stopping would be a good enough reason, Javelin said. I agree that the attack stopping would be nice, but when it comes down to it, we can stand up to your ponies for a lot longer than you. I want the attacks to stop to spare the lives of the ponies I lead, but it's not good enough reason for me to sign some kind of truce with you. What can the Annihilators do to offer Trotston? Eris spoke up. Rusty, it's a little unfair to ask Javelin to give you more. Her town isn't rich and can't offer much. He looked over at her. I can't just go back home and tell my ponies that we've made peace with the Annihilators for nothing more than a promise that they'll stop attacking us. What else can she offer, though? I asked. I've been inside Spitfire's Flight Academy, and apart from well-trained guards and a good doctor, they don't have much to offer. She's right. Rusty. I'm not sure what else I can offer, Javelin said. Rusty glared at her for a long moment, then said, I want access to the Ministry of Peace and Ministry of Wartime Technologies files. I know you have them both, since both ministries were using the base towards the end of the war. Hell no! Those files are ours! What do you need them for? Smokescreen shouted. Wait a minute. You mean there's files from two of the ministries at Spitfire Flight Academy? I asked. There are, Rusty said. My sister was told as much when she was there. Those files can help us out a lot, especially the ones from the MWT. Javelin put up a hoof to stop Smokescreen from shouting again. You are right, Rusty. But the information in those files is not just for any pony to see. We don't like any pony to know that we even have them. If the Steel Rangers knew about those files, they would start coming after us, just like they are with Shrotston. I understand that I'm not worried about the Rangers right now. If you want my help, then this is my piece. First, you'll stop the attacks against my ponies in my town. Second, you'll let a few of my top scientists, along with myself, look through all the files you have and let us make some copies. If you do this, I'll help your town in any way I can. I'll provide food, tech, chems for your medical staff, and even ponies that you can trust to move into the base so your worries about inbreeding will go away. Rusty said. Javelin, that's not a bad offer. I think you could really think about it. I said, keeping my tone light. 
You don't understand what will be at risk if something goes wrong, Javelin said. I understand more than you know, Javelin. This is my offer, and I'm not going to back down, Rusty said. For a long, tense moment, the two leaders looked into each other's eyes. Finally, Javelin let out a long sigh. Fine, I accept. But we need to set down rules on who will be allowed to see the files and figure out how this peace treaty will be written out. I can live with that, Rusty said. Eris smiled. Good. Well, if it's finished, then why don't we get this all down in writing so we can finish this up? They both agreed, and Eris called over one of her griffins and had him start writing out the agreement between the two settlements. It took longer than I thought it would. Apart from what they already agreed on, Bite threw in that she saw as big as a problem down the road. She was worried that sooner or later one of the ponies from either side would break the treaty. Both leaders agreed and decided that five ponies from each side would go to live with one another to serve as some kind of hostage. This was up to ensure that neither side would break the treaty. To everyone's surprise, Smokescreen offered herself up as one of the hostages. Well, everyone's surprise but mine. Smokescreen has wanted to get away from Spitfire Flight Academy ever since she met Tripwire. It took another two hours to get a final document written, when finally signed by both ponies. During that time, I had to break up three fights between Bite and Smokescreen, and eight arguments between Javelin, Smokescreen, and Bite. The only pony who didn't seem to keep fighting was Rusty. Finally, it was over. Javelin stood up and smiled. Since this is all done, I should get back so I can talk to the other leaders about what was decided. I'll be sure to meet with you in a week so we can swap the ponies who'll be moving. As a sign of my trust and good intentions, I'll have Smokescreen go with you back to Trotston. As long as she doesn't cause us any trouble, then we'll be fine. She'll do well in Trotston, I'm sure. Rusty said. Bite crossed her forelegs, looking sour. She's not staying in my room. Don't worry about that, Bite. Rusty said, looking over at Smokescreen. Are you okay with leaving with us tomorrow? I will understand if you want to go home first and get some belongings. She shook her head. I'll be fine. Javelin will make sure to send my things with the others next week. Javelin moved over and hugged her granddaughter. Remember that this treaty is still new and I need you to be good. Your actions will carry a lot of weight with how the rest of Trotston sees us. I know, Gran. I won't let you down. Are you sure you'll be okay heading back with the others? The old mare laughed. I'll be just fine. I'll see you in a week. She'll be in good hooves. Don't you worry. Rusty said as Javelin started to head out with two of her guards. Javelin, can I ask you something before you leave? I said before she got too far away. Turning back towards me, she nodded. What can I help you with, Courier? Did Dr. Gauze find anything in Wind Thrasher's blood? Anything that could help her? As a matter of fact, he did say something about that before I left. In all the goings-on, I forgot to tell you. He thinks that he figured something out, but he won't know for sure. He still has to run a few more tests, to be certain. You can come visit us in a few days, if you want, and try talking to him. Maybe he'll be finished up by then. She said, giving me a smile. We'll do that. Thank you, Javelin. She waved a hoof as she turned to leave. Don't worry about it, Courier. I hope we can see you soon. In the meantime, stay safe out there. Well, that was a lot easier than I thought it would be, Eris said, yawning. I thought it'd be taken for days for them to come to an agreement. I think that they both wanted this stupid fight to end. From what I saw, both Rusty and Javelin have had a lot of respect for each other. I think that helped a lot, I said as I got up and stretched. I think I'm ready for a nap. Is there anything else I need to do, or are we finished? Not just yet. I have to talk to Javelin about the rest of our payment before she gets too far away. You, however, don't need to stick around. You can go get some sleep or whatever. Though it seems Rusty still wants to talk to you more. Eris said, pointing behind me. Looking, I saw that Rusty was hanging back, waiting for me. Bite had already run off somewhere. I think you're right. Before you leave, why don't you and your griffins come to our camp and have some dinner with us? I'm sure you don't need to get back to Crimson Canyon just yet. 
She smirked and patted the top of my head. Can't. After I get the payment, I'll have to head back. There's still a lot to be done before the rebirth celebration. Speaking of which, I heard that Aura and the rest of you might be attending. Is that true? Sounds like it. But I think Aura is mostly going for her mother. I don't think she's planning on trying to rejoin. Maybe not. But I hope she does. It'd be nice to have her back with us again. Mara said with a faraway look in her eyes. Anyway, I hope that you make it. The party alone and the music is hella worth it. I laughed. I'll do my best to make sure we get there. Good. I'll see you then. Mara said, flying off with the rest of her griffins to go talk with Javelin. Rusty walked over. That went better than I thought it would. Same here. Now we just have to figure out how to take care of your Steel Ranger problem. I've been thinking about it, and I just can't figure out why Sapphire is acting like this. I said. He's a Steel Ranger. This is what they do. I'm not surprised that they want the Mark II for themselves. I'm sure once they get mine, they'll start trying to get yours as well. That's what I don't get. I know Sapphire, and this isn't what she's like. She's the one who helped me get out of the raider camp alive when I first left my stable. She could have taken the Mark II if she wanted. All she had to do was kill me. Instead, she let me live and helped me take down the camp. There has to be a good reason she's trying to get to them. Or it really isn't Sapphire at all. Could be Envy, I said. You mean one of the sins? What would he have to do with any of this? Rusty asked. He can turn himself into any pony he wants. I'm not sure how he does it. But he has that power. He's taken the form of ponies I care about before, so I wouldn't put it past him. Rusty looked thoughtful. I guess that might be possible. But it's also possible that you didn't know her as well as you thought. I guess, but it just doesn't seem right. I really wish I had the time to go to Hidden Sands and talk to her. I'm not sure that'd be such a good idea, Shadow. I think you should try and figure out what's going on before you go walking into their base. You're right. Anyway, we still need to figure out what to do about your problem. He smiled. I think I have a plan. The only reason the Steel Rangers are threatening us is because they want this. He lifted his gold and red pip buck. If the Mark II isn't in Trotston, then the town won't have to worry about the Steel Rangers. I lifted an eyebrow. Are you going to leave Trotston? He laughed. No, my town needs me, and with this new deal we set up with the Annihilators, I can't just vanish. What I'm thinking about is giving it to Cookie. I trust her to keep it safe, and she hates being stuck in Trotston. Whoa, I don't think that's a good idea. You can't just send a young filly into the wasteland by herself. I was said shocked. I don't plan on sending her alone. I want her to travel with you. Wingnut and her seem to be getting along well, and I'd feel better if she was with the Courier. No way! I have enough problems already worrying about Windthrasher going crazy, Aura's messed up aunt is trying to hunt us down, the Enclave want me dead, my fucked up mother, the Sins, and a town full of ponies who hate me for destroying their old home. Not to mention, I have one kid to worry about as well. I don't need another following me around, especially one that'll be hunted by Steel Rangers. I already have enough problems with one of the branches already, I said. Cookie isn't much younger than you, I believe, and she can take care of herself. You also shouldn't have to worry about the Hidden Sand Steel Rangers for a while. I'm going to send two of my best security ponies out as well, with Fake Mark II, so they can keep them off your trail. It's the only thing I can think of that'll keep Cookie safe, and the Mark II. And that is until I can somehow figure out a way to get this Elder Sapphire to leave us alone. She's more likely to hunt travel... To get her traveling with me than to... If she stayed home, I said, waving my hooves around. He sighed. Maybe, but I still want to do this. Plus, she needs to get out of Trotston regardless of what I do with the Mark II. She was threatened, and I can't let anything happen to her. Please, Shadow, do this for me. I'll do anything for you if you just let her travel with you. I finally gave in. Fine. And don't worry about doing anything for me. Thank you, Shadow. I'll go talk with Cookie now. How long until you're all headed out? As soon as we can. I want to make a stop in New Pegasus before we go to Crimson Canyon. I'll try and be quick then. 
We'll meet you just outside of Crossroads Trading Post, he said, trotting off. I waited until he was out of sight before I started heading towards the edge of the trading post as well. As I walked, I said, Uncle Ori, do you think that Envy could have been masquerading as Sapphire? It took a few minutes for him to respond. Anything's possible. Though I don't think it's Envy. Why do you say that? Elk responded slow, and it sounded like he was still weak. Envy attacked you when you were flying towards the kingdom a week ago. The former elder died around the same time, and this sapphire took over. Envy is a powerful foe, but he can't be in two places at once. Even if the timings worked, there isn't any reason for him to take Sapphire's place in the Steel Rangers. If he wanted to take over, he would have taken over the place of Sandstorm. He would have been next in line to take over. No, Envy is too angry at you right now to go off and mess with the Steel Rangers. I guess you're right. It just doesn't make any sense. How would Sapphire do all of this? There has to be a good reason. I'm sure there is, but for now, it won't know it until you start looking into it. For now, I think you should concentrate on honing your magic and finishing up your current agenda, he said. I know, I said as I reached the road that led toward New Pegasus. How old is Envy anyway? He's really immature in my opinion. He's around your age. I found him a year after Grimm left home. So he is young. I thought as much. Where'd you find him anyway, and how did he get his power? Orichalis chuckled within my shadow. He's had his gift since I first met him. As to where he came from, I'm not sure. I don't even think he remembers his home. When I found him, I was trying to find a runaway Pegasus who fled to the Badlands. I've never found the Pegasus, but I did find Envy. He was being attacked, so I saved him. I took him in because I felt bad for the cold. Gave him a home and a purpose in life. Now that I think about it, I guess I could have done better than turning him into a soldier. What was his name before he was a sin? I asked, wanting to understand that strange Pegasus. He didn't have one. For the first couple months I lived with him, I just called him Kid. He got his name when I saw how much he envied the other foals around him. And since he was already starting to learn how to be a sin, I made him into one, and dubbed him Envy. You raised him? I did. That's probably why he's so angry with you for killing me. To him, it's like you killed the only father figure he had. Orichalos said. If he knew you were a lie, would he stop trying to kill me? I'm sure he would. He's always done what I've told him to do, Orichalos said. If he attacks you again, I'll be sure to stop him. So don't worry about him so much. I'll try, I said, as I sat down next to the road waiting for my friends who were finishing up with their shopping. After some time had passed, I started to get bored. So getting up again, I started to look around the area, thinking about what life was going to be like with Bite following us around. I was a little outside of Crossroads Trading Post when I thought I saw something behind a bush not far off. Pulling out my plasma rifle, I started walking towards it, when a mare said from behind me, Hello, miss. Why are you all the way out here? Turning around quickly, with my plasma rifle leading the way, I found myself looking at the bartender from Crossroads. Lowering my plasma rifle, I blushed again, saying, Sorry, you scared me. She smiled wide, then winked at me. It's quite all right. I was just wondering why you're so far away from the trading post. There are a lot of dangers around here, you know. I was just waiting for my friend, that's all. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Oh, that's quite all right. I'm Black Licorice. I have had the run of the tavern for many years now. That name rang a bell. You don't happen to know a zebra named Yaksha, do you? She scratched up her face as she was thinking hard. I don't think so. Hmm. Strange. She said she something once about doing things with a mare named Black Licorice. Thought it may have been you. She giggled. Well, it's possible I did meet her once. I have a reputation around here for being an escort, if you know what I mean. I blushed more. 
Not every day you run into a mayor who's willing to say something like that. Why are you blushing so much? She said, getting very close to me, batting her eyes. Backing up slowly, I said, No reason. I just tend to blush easily. She kept walking towards me, keeping the space between us very small. Wait a minute. You're the courier, aren't you? I had no idea the pony from the radio would be so young. Or so cute. I tried to back up more, doing everything I could to get the distance between our muzzles to widen. Yes, I am, and thank you. But can you back up a little? She moved her muzzle even closer to mine. Why? I know you find me attractive. And I can see it in your beautiful red eyes. I already have someone. And she wouldn't be happy if she saw you this close to me. Who? That griffin? She's buying medical supplies. She doesn't have to know, and I promise you you'll enjoy what I have to offer. Her muzzle was so close to me now, I could almost feel her breath rolling over my muzzle. No. I don't want to betray Aura. As I said this, my hind leg bumped against something. Looking back, I saw I just backed into the dark shape I'd seen before Black Licorice came over. Mufa just bumped into a dead body. It looked like some pony killed her to hide the body in the bushes. Then I saw I was a mare. Not just any mare. It was the same mare who was way too close to me right now. The body was Black Licorice. And she'd been dead for a day or two now. Then who was talking to me? I looked back at the imposter just as something slid between the gaps in my armor barding and sank between my ribs. It felt like some pony had just bucked me in the chest. It was hard to breathe, as if one lung wasn't going to work right. I looked up to her face, again as a green glow started around the mare's body, and watched as she changed into a green and black pegasus. He started to chuckle. Hello again, Pipsqueak. You really should be more careful. I mean, you know by now that I can be any pony. I looked down just in time to see him pull a long, thin knife out of the side of my chest. Blood spurted from the wound as pain ran up my body. I could feel blood slowly leaking into my left lung. I tried to take a deep breath, but it was like sucking in air through a straw. My vision flickered and I fell to the ground, trying to, and failing to breathe properly. I wanted to scream for help, but all I could manage to do was make a strange gurgling sound as blood flew up my throat and out my mouth. Envy was laughing as he looked down at me. I knew all I had to do was wait for you to let your guard down, little foal. I can't believe how easy it was to take you out. Doing my best to control what little breath I had, I managed to say, Fuck you, Envy. He moved his muzzle down so it was a few inches from mine. Shrimp, you ain't my type. And I told you I was going to make you pay for what you did to Pride. He... He's not dead. You stupid fuck. Envy kicked me, sending me flying back so that I was lying next to the dead bar mare. Slowly walking towards me, he said, Don't you dare try and tell me lies, small fry. I saw what happened to him. Do you have any idea what you did? Pride was the closest thing to a father I had. He took me in, taught me how to fight. He helped me be what I am now. I lost all of that because of you. You don't understand, Envy. He's my... His hoof slammed into my face. For a long moment, I was blinded by pain. If I could scream, I would. Envy just laughed. Yeah, I've waited a long time to watch you suffer like this. That wound in your side won't kill you, at least not quickly. He cackled crazily, giving me a grisly grin. I'm gonna sit here and watch you slowly suffocate as blood fills your lung, and then I'm gonna drop your puny body in front of your friends and watch their horrified reactions as I slice them down, one by one. The courier mare will be no more, and every pony will fear the sins again. Everything will go back to the way it used to be. His cackling got louder and even more crazy. A black shape shot out of my shadow, blasting into envy and sending the green pegasus flying back a few feet. The black blob changed a moment later into the pony shape it did before when Oricalus had escaped the crystal. His purple eyes glared at envy. Envy, stop this right now! 
Envy looked speechless. For a moment, nothing was said until Envy finally spoke in awe. Pride. Is that really you? My uncle ignored him as he turned towards me. Don't worry, Star. I can fix that. Just hold still. The shadowy horn glowed. A moment later, I felt the skin was knitting back together where Envy had stabbed me. Then I slowly started a cough, expelling a wad of congealed blood. After that, I was able to take in a nice deep breath. Thank you, Uncle Ori. How'd you do that? Medical spells were one of the first kind of magic I mastered. I can't do much more than that for you, though. My shadow powers make medical spells hard, so try not to let him stab you again. Envy looked over at us, and what Orikalis just did. Pride. You helped her. Why? Orikalis looked back at Envy, and his form shifted. A moment later, he looked like the stallion he used to when I first met him. His coat was gold, his mane as black as night, and his eyes a deep violet. The only difference was shadows weren't flowing off his body like water. And now I could see his cutie mark. His real cutie mark. The same one he showed me when he interrupted the memory orb back at the, my father and the stranger captured me. She's not our enemy, Envy. She's my niece. She's Grimm's daughter. I realized this right before she fired that weapon. I was able to break a part of myself away and attach it to her shadow. I'm not going to let you or any pony else hurt her while I live, Orikalis said. But pride, we were ordered to take her down. She's the enemy of the Enclave. No, she's not. If you hadn't flown off and gone rogue, you'd know that by now. Nightshade is the new High Council pony, Envy. And he's forgiven her crimes. Nightshade's a traitor to the Enclave, and you know it, Pride! Envy screamed. No, he's not. He's the one who ordered the Sins disbanded, Pride. He put that price on the boss's head. He wants us all dead. I never went rogue. I just refused to listen to that pathetic excuse for a leader who took on your name. Now, I find you here, protecting the mayor who's made our life hell for two months. What the fuck? Envy said his voice getting louder. I can't believe that Pride the Arrogant would stoop so low. You're betraying your team for this. Pipsqueak. It was my uncle's turn to yell. This Pipsqueak is my niece. The very same one I thought was dead for ten years. I made a promise to her when she was young. That promise was to always look after her, and I will not go back on my word. You also made me a promise, Pride. To always look after me and help me become the strongest pony in Equus. Orikalis closed his eyes and sighed. I did. But Envy, I can't do that because you're not even a... Don't say it! Envy yelled. His eyes no longer looked angry. He looked scared. Why did he look scared? Say what? That you aren't a pony. The truth hurts, Envy. You should know that better than any pony. Envy put his hooves to his ears as he started to say to himself, I am a pony. I'm a pegasus. The strongest pegasus to every part of the Enclave. And I am a pony. I am a pony. I am. I am. I am. No. You're not. You're nothing more than a bug that tries to pretend at being something he's not. Urikalis said his horn glowing again. I'm sorry, Envy, but I can't let this go on any more. Envy stopped his chanting as his eyes fell on my uncle's. He looked half mad now and showed another grisly smile. You aren't pride. No, I'm not. At least I'm not anymore. I gave up that name the title as leader of the sins. I'm Orichelis, son of Fallen Star and Quartz. Brother to Grimoire Spell and uncle to Shadowstar the Courier Mare. Orichalus yelled. Either you leave and never look back, Envy, or I'll do to you what I should have done years ago. Envy started to cackle like a mad pony again. Oh, really, Pride? You think you can take me on? Do you remember who's the strongest one here? In case you forgot, that's me. I'm Envy the Jealous. 
first member of the Seven Sins of Equinity. That might be true, but you can't kill me. Orikala said with a grin, pulling at his lips. Uncle Ori, you're still too weak. You can't fight him, I said. No, Star. I'm not running away. <laughs> Some pony has a high opinion of themselves, Envy said, with a glow appearing around his body. Time for you to learn your place, Pride! The glow surrounding Envy expanded, and he transformed into a creature I've only seen in a book, a manticore. Taking in a deep breath, Envy roared. The large scorpion tail snapped forward right towards Orikalis. He pushed me back as he jumped out of the way, yelling, Star! Run and get help! No way! I'm helping! You're in no condition to do this! Pulling out Mom's plasma rifle, I took aim and fired. Envy was too busy trying to attack my uncle and to pay attention to me. The blast of green goo slammed right into his chest, throwing him back. For a moment, I thought it worked, until Envy looked over at me with a crazy eye. The green goo sliding off his chest like it was nothing. Stupid runt. You're gonna need something more powerful than that to stop me. He attacked as I tried to fire again, but a black blade of darkness flew towards him, forcing Envy to jump back and focus his attention on Orichalis. My uncle had at least two dozen arms of shadows coming off his body, each one with a blade at the end. He looked over at me, yelling, Envy isn't a normal creature, Star. His true body has thick armor on it, and plasma will not do anything to him. You need something stronger. Damn right you do. Envy yelled, his body changing again. Hey, Pride, how about we try something else? <laughs> his crazed laughter getting gradually louder. His body transformed into a large... What the hell was that? It looked like a toad only twice the size of a pony. Whatever it was, Orichalis stopped trying to attack. He took a few steps back. Ah, oh, fuck. Uncle Ori, what? I charted to say, but Envy answered the question before I even asked it. That's right, Pride. A flash toad. I finally learned how to turn into one, and better yet, I can do the same thing they can. Goodbye, Pride! Star, cover your eyes! Orichalis yelled as his body turned into a shadow, and he flew towards me. I just started to do what he said when Envy's body exploded into a bright, blinding light. It was like some pony turned the sun and on right in front of me. I was just able to get my eyes closed as the flash of light went off, but it didn't seem to matter. It was like the light was so bright, it pierced right through my eyelids. I screamed and tried to cover my eyes with my hooves. It was nothing to the sound my uncle made. It was like a creature like no other was suffering from the pain, po worst pain possible. The scream pierced my ears, adding the pain flung through my head. I fell to the ground, rolling into a ball waiting for the pain to stop. When it finally stopped, I tried to open my eyes. But the eyes saw nothing but white and black spots. My ears were ringing from the sound of that horrible scream, but I was able to pick up the sound of hooves slowly walking towards me and the unmistakable chuckle from Envy. <laughs> that fool should have known better. He was right, though. Even that won't kill him, but it will keep him down long enough to take care of you. I could just make out the shape of Envy. At least the light didn't blind me. Then a hoof kicked me hard in the stomach, sending me flying back a few feet. I cried out in pain, still curled into a ball. I could hear the asshole walking closer again, his insane chuckle piercing the air. I opened my eyes again, and this time I could make out his features. It was a pegasus again, a crazed look on his face. Doing my best to ignore the pain, I started to get back to my hooves. Stay away from me. Or what? He kicked me again. You're pathetic, you know that small fry. The only reason you've made a name for yourself is because of your fucking friends and a bit of luck. Another kick. You only won against the Raiders because of that Steel Ranger mare and that runaway Pegasus. Kick. And the only reason you got out of that stable was because of the Griffin that followed you in. Kick. She was the reason you got out of that town of fiends as well, I'm sure. Kick. If it wasn't for that Olicorn and Frosty Summit and the Pegasus and the trench coat, 
We would have had you. Kick. You only survived Appleton because of a fucking super weapon. Nothing you've done has been because you're special. You're nothing but a run of a mare who doesn't know when to give up or when to fucking die. And he kept kicking me relentlessly as he continued to rant. At this point, I'm spitting up so much blood I can fill a bucket. A mare like you uses her friends to keep her alive, then uses them as a shield to take the credit for the deeds they've done. You're nothing. You don't deserve the friends you have. I spat more blood as I looked up into his face. You're right. I don't deserve the friends I've had. I've done things to them that no pony should ever forgive, but they still stay with me. Do you know why? It's because they're real friends, and they don't give up on some pony they care about. You might be right. I've survived a lot of shit because of them, but you seem to have missed something about me. Oh yeah? Why's that? He scoffed. My friends aren't the only reason I've survived this long. I've survived because I don't care if I die, as long as I can take down the pony who's trying to hurt others. Where most ponies run away from danger, I run towards it. I said with a small smile, blood leaking from my mouth. Oh, and there's the fact that you all are fucking idiots and you keep forgetting that I'm a fucking unicorn! For a second, Envy's eyes went wide. It vanished in a flash of crimson light as I blasted him with my expulsion spell. Pulling a healing potion out of my saddlebags, I drank it down quickly as I jumped to my hooves. Pulling out my sword, I rushed Envy. The blast seemed to stun him for a second, and it knocked him back a few feet. Using some of the skills I learned from Yaksha, my dad, and Dora, I attacked. Envy wasn't called the first sin for nothing. He ducked under my first slash, jumped back to avoid the follow-up stab. He flapped his wings and took to the air. I tried to blast him again with another expulsion spell, but missed as he dove to his right. Nice try, Halfbind, but you're a long way off from being good enough to take me on. He transformed again, turning into a griffin. He flew in faster than his razor-sharp talons slashing for my face. I brought the sword down to block his grip on my face, knowing the blade would be able to easily cut through his body like paper. I was so very wrong. As he drew closer, one talon transformed into what could only be a dragon's claw. It slammed into me, my blade meaning nothing to the size of that paw. Once again, I was sent flying across the dry landscape, my body protesting with new pain. My sword went flying out of my magic and out of sight. Looking back towards the griffin with a dragon's arm in place of its normal arm, I cursed. The fuck? You can change one part of your body? He chuckled, the dragon arm turning back into a griffin's. There's so much about my abilities that you don't know, Runt. As he flew towards me again, I heard my uncle's voice in my ear. Star, use the whistle. I teleported right before Envy landed his attack. Then I reappeared and I said, Glory, where are you? I'm in your shadow again. I was able to get to it as that blast of life went off. But it still took its toll on me. I'll be fine shortly, but not fast enough to help you. He'll kill you before I can do anything. Now stop talking and use that damn whistle, he said. That trick won't keep you safe forever, pipsqueak. Envy yelled as he twisted around, transforming again, this time into a hellhound. Thankfully, it wasn't as big as the only other hellhound I've seen before. Maybe because he wasn't with greed when I was down in the bramble. Still, it wasn't much comfort. Envy dove straight at the ground and disappeared into it, leaving a large hole behind with some dirt around it. Fuck, this wasn't good. What if Wingnut said was right about hellhounds? Envy could attack me from anywhere. It wasn't a bad move. I couldn't do much if I couldn't see him coming. The bad thing about this trick was that the hellhounds attacked you from underground. You had no idea where they were. You were caught off guard because you had no idea of the danger that was right under your hoof. I did, and that little bit of knowledge would help. I hope. <clears throat> Pulling out the whistle I'd gotten from the Emperor, I waited. Closing my eyes, I listened for any sign of the hellhound version of Envy. I didn't have to wait long. A minute went by, and then I felt the very slight tremor underneath me. 
Opening my eyes, I jumped out of the way right as the eruption of dirt and rubble went off right where I just was. The edge of a single claw caught my duster, ripping a small chunk off the edge, but it was better than the alternative. Flipping around, I saw Envy flying into the air, his long arms and claws extended up. He landed a moment later. Lucky, but how long can you keep avoiding me? I didn't give him time to say more. Bringing the whistle to my lips, I blew on it hard. Instantly, Envy started to scream, his claws coming up to cover his ears. Unlike before, when Cutter used the whistle, Envy wasn't in a form he could easily fly away with. He fell to his knees, screaming louder as I kept blowing on the whistle, pain written on his face. I stopped for a second to take a breath, as I said quickly, What, Envy? Can't handle a little sound? He tried to attack me. Sick, Colt! I blew the whistle again. Again, he fell. Stop it! I took another breath and kept at it, ignoring the pained expression on his face. A glow appeared around him again, but this time he didn't transform. It was like the sound this thing gave off made it impossible for him to use his power. As I kept blowing, Oracalus said in my ear, He has to concentrate his form. But he can't do that when he's in this much pain. Kill him while he's down. It'll be the only chance you get. I couldn't have if I could find my sword, but I'm not sure if my weapons would do much damage to him. As I watched Envy writhe in pain, I noticed something. Like before, when Cutter did this to him, it looked like Envy's features were melting. It started with his face. The face of the hellhound he was impersonating was sliding away. Under it, I could see what looked like a dark green, almost black armor. His body was starting to sink in on itself. In seconds, he was the same size as me. He looked up at me again. His eyes were now a bright blue, and they were getting bigger. He spoke in a voice that was different than what I was used to. It had a hiss to it, almost like Wind Thrasher, when she was under bloodlust. Please, stop! I was going to let up. I didn't care how much pain he was in. He was the pony who was responsible for Silver's death. Already Callus may have been the one to kill her, but Envy was the one who helped Greed take her. He was the one who impersonated her. He was the one who gave all the information to the rest of the Sins on who I was and who was important to me. If he was in a great deal of pain, all the better. A moment later, there was a flash of green light and something else was laying on the ground, curled up into a ball. I stopped blowing the whistle as I looked in disgust at the pitiful-looking creature. He reminded me of a pony, at least in general size and shape, but it was like a mocking joke of a pony. In place of a skin and a coat, his body was enclosed in a dark green exoskeleton. Large, bright blue eyes that were only blue. It looked like a small, spiked, curved horn was on his head. Blood-red bug wings were poking out of his back. His hooves had random holes running up his legs, and large fangs that would make Wing Thrasher jealous poke out of his muzzle. What the hell are you? I asked, backing up a little bit. Oricalus came out of my shadow again, and turned back into his normal body. He's a changeling. One of the last of his race left on Equus. Envy was a descendant of the changeling queen from 200 years ago. Envy looked up at us both, his body shivering violently as he looked almost pitiful. I'm a pony! No, you're not, Envy. You just wanted to be a pony. You can change your looks, but you can never ever change what you are, Oricalus said. Star, this is the best time to kill him. A changeling is weak when they're in their normal form. After what you did to him, he won't be able to change you anything for a few minutes. I looked down at Envy and felt bad for the shivering creature. Sure, Envy was rude, cruel, and deadly, but right now all I saw was some pony who just wanted to be like every pony else. Looking over at my uncle, I asked, Why does he keep saying he's a pony? Because I am. I don't care what I was born as. I'm nothing like the rest of my kind. I'm stronger, smarter, more powerful than they could ever be. Envy said, seemingly coming back to his senses. Oricalus looked away. When I found him near the Badlands, he was close to death. The rest of his kind were attacking him because they thought he was weak. 
In reality, it was because their current queen couldn't control him. Changelings are a collective. One changeling who is normally bigger and stronger than the rest controls all of them. If a changeling like Envy is born who has their own will, that changeling becomes a threat to the current ruler's power. To this day, I'm not sure why I did it, but I stopped them from killing him. They tried to attack me when I interfered, so I killed them instead. I took Envy back with me to the Enclave and taught him how to use his power. Envy started to chuckle. You showed me that ponies were more powerful than changelings. While they suffered from the war and the destruction that was brought into this land, ponies, in the clouds, lived normal and ever happy lives. And that's why I vowed to become a pony and become the most powerful one in the Enclave. His tremors had stopped, but I wasn't worried about it. If he tried anything, all I had to do was use the whistle again. So that's why you're named Envy. You're envious of Pegasi. You just wanted to be one. And what was your first clue, runt? In all of Equestrian histories, ponies have ended up with the better lives. Queen Chrysalis tried to make a better life for us before the war, and the princesses of Equestria cast her out. Forced the changelings to go back to the horrible lives we lived back then. Why would I want to be a part of a race that always loses? I'd rather be one of you. Even after the war, and with most of your lands destroyed, ponies still find a way to live better than any other race. Envy yelled, starting to get back to his hooves. Stay down, Envy. Oricalus yelled. Envy laughed, again. Pride, 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 pride. Why would I do anything you tell me to do anymore? You betrayed me. You left me all alone. You left the team. Because of what? Some dead niece who isn't dead by siding with her? We lost what little respect we had in the Enclave. Do you even know where your sister is right now? Do you know what she's been doing since you so-called died? I don't care what she's been doing, and I don't care about the team. I only started the sins because I thought my family was gone. Now that I know that's not true, I have no reason to be part of that team. Oricalus yelled, his horn glowing. I'm going to stop you, Envy. Envy laughed again. Really now? From what I can tell, you don't have much power left. I'm betting that most of your shadow magic was destroyed in that blast. You're just an echo of your former self. I bet you wouldn't even rate higher than seven in the sins now. To put it lightly, none of us are scared of you anymore. Envy, you better quiet down before I use this on you again. I said, holding up the whistle of my magic. Envy started to laugh again. In a flash of green, he transformed back into his Pegasus form. You're such a fool, half pint. You really think I came alone? Like I said before, I never went rogue. I just had to make the traitors in our group think I did. Horticalus looked at me, yelling, Star, use it now! I was already moving the whistle to my lips when a bullet passed through it, breaking the whistle by the echo of a rifle. At the same time, there was a flash of blue light from behind Envy, and my mom was standing there, her cloak and hood covering her features like before. Right after she appeared, the beautiful Pegasus that tried to seduce Stardust back at Frosty Summit landed on the other side of Envy. This wasn't good. We were too far from Crossroads Trading Post for any of my friends to notice what was going on, and most of the sins were here. A little bit of Mom's muzzle that I could see was poking up under her hood as she smiled and said, Good work, Envy. You managed to capture two when I sent you after one. Envy's smile grew, giving an insane look to his features. I am the number one sin for a reason, Cloak. Grim, what are you doing here? Oricalus asked, anger filling every word. She looked over at him. I knew you had to still be alive, brother. Tell me, why are you with this mare? Grim, she's Star. She's your daughter. It's true, Mom. Please, you have to believe us, I said, desperately wanting her to listen for once. She scowled. Preposterous. My little Star died years ago. This mare is just trying to trick you, brother. She knows more than she should about our family, and she's trying to use that to keep you from killing her. Now, do your job, Pride, and restrain her. 
Marty Callus moved to stand between myself and the rest. I don't want to hurt her, Grim. She's my niece. I know that for a fact. I've seen her memories. If you'd take five minutes to stop and think, you'd see it too. Even Nightshade could tell if you would just talk to him. You're making a mistake. Am I? Mom asked as she looked back at Oricalus. I don't know if splitting yourself away from most of your power has messed with your mind or not, but you seem to be missing a few things about who this mare is, brother. I know more than you think. Mom grinned. I doubt that very much. You see, this mare isn't my star. She's the daughter of that Steel Ranger mare, Vervain. When my daughter died after we went to Stargazer Labs, I was left with just Vervain, and the small amount of power that was left of Aquila. When we left the labs, we went back to our camps, where this mare, she pointed a hoof at me, was sleeping, waiting for Vervain and myself to get back. I was so heartbroken by the loss of my daughter that I wasn't keeping an eye on the power of Aquila. I didn't know that the creature was still alive. She managed to break free, and she was inside the young filly. I knew that a filly like her couldn't hold the power for very long without dying. I told this to Vervain, and once the filly died, Aquila would vanquish or try to find another host. I needed to get Aquila out of the filly, but Vervain wouldn't let me. She attacked me and tried to run. I cast a memory spell on her, but it hadn't worked as I hoped it would. Vervain only forgot a few things about the filly and seemed to think she was my star. I didn't see any reason to correct her, but Vervain stopped trusting me. The same night, when I took off the Mark II so I could check a few things on it, Vervain stole it and ran off with the filly. Once they were in Stable 28, where Vervain had been working undercover for the Steel Rangers, I knew I could get to them. Vervain must have still thought the filly was star, because she filled this mare's head with stories that aren't true. And now you're falling for the same lies, brother. That's not true, I yelled. I remember you being in Stable 28 with me, Mom. Your memories are messed up because some pony who used something on you to make you forget about me. Aunt Vervain never had any foals because she can't. For a moment, I saw her gray eyes glaring at me from under her hood, then vanished back under it. You have no idea what you're talking about. Yes, my memories were disrupted because of that fucking hunter hex. But I still remember some things, and I know that you aren't my star. I realized who you were when we last met. After you told me to look into Aquila, the creature who was hiding inside of you. Once I knew that you had Aquila, I knew who you were. First, I stole the key to unlocking Falling Shadows, letting Aquila live inside of you. Then, you take my Mark II, which is the only way to unlock the terminal for the project. You left it for me, you fucking bitch! I screamed at her. Oh, child. You have no idea what's really happened to you. I think that you've let that monster inside of you take hold too much. She's making you think you remember me, but you don't. You only know what Aquila has let you know. Maybe you've seen some of my memory orbs, too. I have no idea. That would explain how you know more than you should. I did manage to lose a few of mine a few years back. Mom said. Now, both of you will come with me. I'm sick of this game. We aren't going anywhere with you, Grim. I'm here to protect Star. Orikala said. He's right. I don't care how many ponies you have fighting with you, I'd rather die than let you win. I said, pulling on Aquila's power that was now my own. As I did, my coat changed again, as its power filled me and my horn. I'm the courier, and I won't let a pony like you do any more harm, mother. I thought that if my body looked like it did back in the day, the mom would see that I was her morning star. I was wrong. She frowned, saying in a harsh voice, You can wear the face of my star, Aquila, but I won't let you fool me as well. She looked at her own pitbuck, saying into it, Wrath, you know what to do. Wrath's dead, Orikalos said. Stardust killed him back at the kingdom. Mom smiled again. Oh, I know, but he was worthless. Not like my new Wrath. Another shot went off in the distance, right as I jumped back. Something about holding on to Aquila's power seemed to be giving me a sense of when I was in mortal danger. Before that shot went off, it felt like something inside me was telling me to jump out of the way. 
As soon as my hooves touched the ground again, I teleported, reappearing a good distance away, then turning my head towards where the shot had come from, and fired a massive spell towards the sniper. Before my magic hit, however, I saw the Pegasus with a light blue coat fly away just in time. As he did, he aimed again and fired. Again, I was able to avoid the shot. I looked down to where the bullet hit in the ground. I was surprised to see that instead of a hole in the ground, where the bullet should have landed, there was a small blue dart. Mom wasn't trying to have her new wrath kill me. She was trying to drug me so I couldn't fight anymore. As I moved, Dory Callus tried to attack Mom. Envy blocked him by transforming into the dragon again. My uncle's blades of darkness glanced off Envy's scales like they were made of steel. Envy opened his maw and blasted fire out of my uncle. His body vanished as the flames passed over him. When the flames died down, Orikalos was already reappearing next to Mom. Nice try, sis, but you have to do something better than use Envy to stop me. So predictable, brother. Mom said as her horn started to glow from under her hood. Magical circles appear around Orikalos on every side. They flashed and golden chains flew out around them, wrapping him in so he couldn't move an inch. Have you forgotten, brother? I know just about as much about your powers as you do. I also know how to stop you when I need to as well. The hell did you do? Orichalus yelled, trying to pull free. His body even turning to shadow again for a moment, for the chains glowed brighter, and he was forced back into his normal pony form. New spell I invented. I call them the Chains of Celestia. A very powerful binding spell for stopping creatures of darkness like you. Now you stay here while I go deal with the courier. She said, turning towards me, then yelling. Wrath, stop playing with her and finish this. If we take too much longer, she'll have the NLR and her friends to deal with. I drew on more of Aquila's power, letting it fill me till I felt like I was going to burst. My head started to throb and a small ringing filled my ears as power flooded through me. I don't think so, Grim. Another shot rang out, but I was already moving. I ignored the presence of Wrath, who was trying to fire one of those darts into me. I ignored Envy, who lunged for me. I only cared about stopping my mom. As I teleported out of the way of Envy, I remembered one of the spells in Mom's spellbook. Even better, with Aquila's magic coursing through me, I knew how to do the spell. With a cocky smile on my face that would make Stardust proud, I fired the spell right at Mom. She smiled as well, casting a shield spell to protect her from what she must have thought was an attack. Funny thing about shield spells... If you cast one to stop a blast of magic from hurting you, then it will, most of the time. But if you cast one that protects you from a magical blast and the unicorn you're facing is trying to use a spell like Memory Spell, it doesn't work as well. This is why you should always be prepared for magic of all kinds, and cast wards around yourself to keep yourself safe. Her shield spell didn't even slow down my attack, because I wasn't trying to hurt her. All I wanted to do was for her to remember at least one thing. My magic wrapped around her head. Mom's cocky grin faded as well, as a look of shock replaced it. I slammed into her as the concentration with her mind was made. Please, remember me. The world melted away. You know, Grim, I'm starting to get a little worried about Shadow. Ravain said as Mom and her walked through the lower levels of Stable 28. It had to be level 9 because it's the only level I've seen that had plants growing all over. They were in the small apple orchard towards the back of level 9, where it was unlikely to be heard. What do you mean? She's been doing very well the past year. She hasn't had any problems with Aquila and her magics on four months now. Mom said as she used her magic to pull one of the oddly colored apples off a tree. She bit into it. I still can't get over the strange way that these apples taste. They are... Way too sweet, and not even close to being as juicy as the ones I grew up around. Ravain sighed, leaning against the tree. She asked me yesterday, Why do mares and stallions have to be together? I told her it's to make sure that ponykind lived on. Then she asked me what would happen if a mare wanted to be with another mare, and why they can't have a foal together. Mom spat the apple out of her mouth as she started to laugh. I'd think it would be rather hard to procreate when you're missing the proper equipment. Grim, this isn't funny, Vervain said. She's a filly, Vervain. Foles always ask silly questions 
about where fools come from and all that when they're around Shadow's age. Mom said as she fought to keep down her giggling. There's nothing to worry about. It's normal. Grim, what if it isn't? I mean, I could understand her asking me the first question. But why would she ask about two mares being together? This could be the first sign that she might like mares. Ravain said, doing her best to keep her voice down. I felt Mom roll her eyes. So what if she does? She's still my little star, and I love her. Though I still don't think you have to worry about it. She's just curious, that's all. She's young. Grim, I asked her why she wanted to know, and do you know what she told me? I wasn't there, so no, I don't. Mom said sarcastically. She told me that she thinks it would be nice to live with a mare when she's older, and not just as a roommate. She thinks it would be a lot better than being around a stallion because she thinks stallions are mean. She said she loves her friend Starberry Milkshake. Mom started to laugh again. Over vain. Why are you so worried? Of course she doesn't like stallions yet. She's a foal. Not all ponies grow up around steel rangers being taught that you have to be with a stallion one day. They don't teach that at Steel Rangers, and you know that, Grim. The Steel Rangers are fine with same-sex relationships. Even if that was true, Stable 28 does teach fillies and colts that it's bad to be with a pony of the same gender as you because they can't afford to have the population fall. I don't care who she loves, but the Overmare will. If you want to keep her from kicking you two out, then you need to do something about this. There has to be some spell you can use that will make sure she stops talking like this. Vane said. She looked scared. I could feel Mom's face fall a little. What you're asking me to do is manipulate the way my daughter feels towards other ponies. I've done a lot of bad things in my life, Vane, messing with Shadow's memories being one of the worst. But I won't do that to her. So you'd risk the two of you being kicked out of here? For this? Yes, I would. Mom said, her voice going quiet. When I was a filly for vain, my parents were always trying to force me to be the kind of unicorn they thought I should be. They always treated me like crap because I wasn't as powerful as my brother, and I had a hard time learning spells. When I would get a spell wrong, my father would beat me for it and force me to try again. They tried to force me to be something I'm not. I won't do the same thing to my daughter. It's bad enough that I've taken away everything who she's is already trust to protect her, just from one of my mistakes. If she happens to fall for a mare or a stallion, I won't care, because it'll be what she wants, and not what I think she should be. So yes, I would risk being kicked out of here just so she's happy. Grim, I'm sorry that happened to you when you were young, but this isn't the same thing. You told me yourself that Shadow needs to stay here where it's safe. If you both get kicked out of here, what good would that do her? Mom looked up. If the Overmare tries to kick us out because of how my daughter feels, then I'll do it to her what I did to her mother. Shadow will leave Stable 28 when I say it's time. You can't kill every pony who gets in your way, Grim. Yes, I can, and I will if I have to. Mom said, her voice going cold. Vervain sighed again. Fine. At least let me sit down with her and explain things about what this stable is like when it comes to same-sex relationships. At least it'll help her understand why she needs to keep it a secret. Fine. But don't make her feel like she's bad for feeling this way. Though I still think you're overreacting to a few normal questions from a young filly. Maybe, but with how much the Overmare is watching you too, I'd like to keep her reasons for kicking you out as minimal as possible, Vervain said. On a different subject, have you been able to learn more about the other project? Mom closed her eyes and leaned against the tree. No. Even the small notes I was able to finally decrypt weren't much help. A few memory orbs that are protected with a password are useless to me as well. Nightstalker was very good about making those hard to get into. He had Monette put passwords on them that had to do with his life before he came back to Equestria as a child. One is the name of the Griffin, who gave him his scar. Another was his real mother's name. And another was the only pony he ever loved. I mean, hell, I didn't think he loved any pony. I tried his wife, his daughter, his adopted sister, Luna, 
None of those worked. Have you tried Greta? Vervain asked. Mom laughed. First of all, it said some pony, not some griffin. And those two had bad falling out a couple of years after the Enclave started. She was the only one who ever seemed to really care about him, though. At least, that's what she told me. Mom sighed again. I guess it couldn't hurt. Though I'm sure it's another dead end, and it still won't help me with the rest. Information on Night Stalker is hard enough to come by. Information about him before he was Night Stalker is like trying to get the Enclave and the Steel Rangers to make peace. Now that's impossible. Vane said with a laugh. Nothing's impossible, just extremely hard and very unlikely to ever happen. Mom said, still chuckling as she looked down at her pipbuck. Damn. I have to get back to R&D. Can you keep an eye on Shadow tonight? You know I will. Mom got back to her hooves. Thanks. She turned to leave. Oh, and Vervain? Why did Shadow go to you with her questions and not me? The expression of Vervain's face was sad. I'm around her more than you. She just felt more comfortable asking me, I think. But I'm her mom. She should be asking me these kinds of questions, not you. I know, Grim. But you work most of the day and night. She doesn't know how to talk to you about this kind of thing. If you want her to do that, you need to spend more time with her. I know. The memory itself seemed to take a few minutes to go by. But unlike a memory orb, the reality only took a second. Envy was still turning around after making me, uh, missing me during an attack, and Mom's face was still struck in a look of shock. I was meaning to make her remember more, but something seemed to stop the spell. Pain seemed to be running up my right, uh, left leg. Looking down, I saw what must have forced me to stop casting the spell. A sharp black rod was sticking out of my leg. Following its length to its source, I saw it was held by lust. Naughty little filly, trying to attack our boss like that. Did you forget about little old me? She said in her mocking voice. Oh, fuck off, you worthless excuse for a peg. I didn't get to finish what I was saying because Mom blasted me with one of her own spells. I was sent flying as the spell slammed into me. What the fuck did you do to me? She yelled, one hoof to her temple. I made you remember something. I said, getting back to my hooves. What's the matter, Mom? You're starting to realize that you might be wrong about what you think you know? You bitch! That was nothing more than you trying to plant false memories! Mom said, but before she could say any more, a loud alarm started to go off in the NLR camp next to Crossroads Trading Post. Envy looked towards it and grinned as he turned back into his pony form. What do you say, boss? You want me to take care of him? Mom rubbed her head more and pulled her hood down over her eyes as she cursed under her breath. No. I need to get out of here. Envy, you grab my brother. I'll have Wrath grab me. Lust looked over at her. What about the carrier? Mom grinned at me through the obvious pain she was feeling. Oh, she'll come with us in time. I mean, she seems to think that my brother is her uncle. Isn't that right, carrier? I'm sure you'd do anything to save someone you care about. I'm not letting you go anywhere, I said, readying another spell. Star, don't! Orikalis yelled. Let them take me. You need to get to safety. I will be fine. But Uncle Ori... No, you have your own mission to take care of, Orikalis said as Envy flew over him. That's right, little courier. Do as you're told. Lust said. Fuck that! I yelled, firing a blast of magic at Envy. Mom jumped in the way, blocking the magic with one of her shield spells. Now, now, Courier. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. And trust me, you don't want to do this the hard way. Be thankful that I'm in a hurry, and I really need my brother at the moment more than I need you. If you want to get him back, you can come find him in Lost Alicorn with me. Mom said. It seemed as if the pain from that memory was starting to fade already. Envy transformed into the griffin again, and took hold of the glowing chains around my uncle. See you soon, shrimp. Oh, and just so you know, the next time we meet, you're a dead mare. I read another spell, not caring what uncle said. I'm not going to let him be taken. 
I'm not losing another friend to the sins. Oricalus yelled down at me before I could do more than ready the spell. Star, trust me. Don't do anything else. I'll be fine. I let the spell fade away as I watched Envy fly off with Oricalus. As he was taken away, I could hear hooves thundering from behind. The NLR were almost here. Another Pegasus fell from the sky, pointing his rifle at me. Are you sure we can't take her here, boss? He said as Mom walked over to him. Don't worry, Raph. She'll be a good little mare and go where I told her to. If she doesn't, then she'll never see my brother again. And we will come back here and kill every pony she loves until she obeys. The Pegasus was taller than the old Raph, and much younger from the sound of his voice. He had a light blue coat, but that was all I could see of him because he was dressed in full-body enclave power armor. He looked over at me, saying, I warned you before, Courier. This is what you get for sticking your nose where it doesn't belong. You should have stayed away from my boss's plan and given her what she wanted a long time ago. If you had, this wouldn't have been happening. Mom smiled. Lust, take care of those NLR pests before you leave, and Wrath, make sure the courier can't interfere. With pleasure, Wrath said, pulling out his rifle again and shooting me with one of his darts. I'm not sure why, but this time I didn't even expect it. What I don't understand is why we don't just take her with us. Because there's something she may be able to help me with. If I take her now, then she'll be useless. Mom said, laughing, as Wrath hoisted his rifle and took hold of Mom as she took off. See you soon. I lost hold of my magic and my legs went weak. Whatever was on that dart seemed to be similar to what the stranger used on me. My body went mostly numb, and soon I was lying on my side, unable to move. Lust giggled and tossed her mane back as she walked closer to me. Oh, poor little courier. You're lucky my boss needs you alive, or I'd take this chance to kill you. You're pathetic. Can't even figure out why you're ranked so high in the sins. The only thing I've seen you do is seduce Stardust and use a weapon that elongates to attack ponies, I said. She moved even closer, not even seeming to care that the NLR soldiers were almost here. Oh, you really think I'm weak just because you haven't seen what I can do, huh? That about covers it. So how are you planning to take down all those soldiers? Going to bat your eyes at them and say, Please don't hurt me, I'm a pathetic whore? She didn't get mad at my taunts. She just moved her face with an inch of mine. You are kind of cute when you're helpless. I think I see what that griffin likes you so much about now. She slowly licked over my cheek, then my nose, then finished at the tip of my horn, kissing the tip of it softly. I couldn't help but shiver of revulsion and pleasure running down my spine. She may be a sin, but she was very, <clears throat> very beautiful. <laughs> I think I like you. I can't wait till Cloak's done with you. Then you'll be all mine. Now you asked what I'm going to do to the NLR? Just sit back and watch. She moved my head so that I could see the NLR ponies as they closed the last few feet between the two of us. Lust slowly walked towards them as they came to a halt, a stallion who was leading the way, saying, Miss, are you okay? We saw what looked like a dragon over here not too long ago and heard gunshots. Oh, sir, thank the goddesses you're here. My friend and I were attacked by envy of the seven sins of Aquinity. She's hurt bad. Can you please help us? He looked over at me, worry written on his face. Don't worry, ma'am, you're safe with us. I'm a veteran ranger. No pony will hurt you anymore. Let's get a better look at your friend, and then we can get her back to the medical tent. Don't listen to her! She's a sin! She's lust! I yelled, but it was too late. Lust opened her mouth, and instead of saying something to defend herself, a sound came out of her muzzle, followed by a red glow from around her neck. As soon as it started, almost every one of the NLR pony's eyes glazed over. The sound was like that otherworldly creature's song. It had a depth to it that made it both scary and mesmerizing at the same time. The sound alone made my head start to swim like I was under the influence of some kind of drug. If she'd been facing towards me, I'm sure the effect would have been a lot stronger. 
Then, as I was trying to clear my head off the strange feeling, the veteran ranger turned towards one of his comrades, yelling, Sergeant, back away from her. She's mine. Fuck you, I saw her first. The stallion yelled back, pulling his rifle off of his back. The veteran ranger had his black revolver out. He blew a hole right in the stallion's head. He turned, and another stallion yelled something about lust being his soulmate. The veteran ranger dropped him before he got close. Then all hell broke loose as every pony that was part of the group started to kill each other, every one saying that the other was trying to steal a beautiful mare away from them. The veteran ranger was horrible to watch as he shot another stallion in the chest, twisted around, grabbed another stallion in a chokehold, and broke his neck. After that, he jumped back and shot another stallion in the groin, blowing the stallion's hood to pieces before finishing him off by stomping on the screaming stallion's head, crushing it into jelly. It was over almost as fast as it started. Soon, only the veteran ranger was left standing, surrounded by at least forty dead NLR ponies. He bowed to Lust, who was still making the strangest singing noise. My love, I have proven that I am the strongest one here. How may I serve you? In between these strange sounds, Lust said, If you love me, then would you please blow your brains out? No, I yelled, but it was too late. The stallion, who was a unicorn, lifted his revolver in his magic. Anything for you. And he blew half his head off, his body falling to the ground, twitching as blood stained the red ground. Lust started to giggle uncontrollably, the sound she was making coming to a halt. Oh, I do so love simple-headed stallions that are so easy to fool. I thought at least the veteran ranger would have been able to break free of my song. But I guess he was more brawn than brains, sadly. The hell did you do? She giggled again as she looked back towards me. Why would I tell you that? I'm not an idiot like some of the others you faced in the sins before. Let's just say, there's good reason they call me Lust. You're a fucking monster. She came close again. That may be true, but I'm a very beautiful one. Oh, how I wish I could take you with me right now and show you the other reasons I'm called Lust. I never get to have fun when I'm on jobs like this. Oh well. She moved her head down and kissed me. Her tongue pushing past my lips and into my muzzle. I was so shocked I had no way of stopping her. She kissed me for what felt like forever. When she pulled away, she licked her lips and said in what had to be the most seductive voice I've ever heard, I don't normally enjoy mares as much as stallions, but I'd make an exception for you. I do so love a helpless little thing like you. Maybe next time I'll think I see your griffin friend coming. I'll see you later, Shadow Star. Before I could say anything, the Pegasus took to the air and was gone. I was left looking at the bloody remains of what had been most of the NLR at the crossroads trading post. Lust had also been right. Not a full minute passed when Aura landed next to me. Shadow, what the fuck happened here? All I could do was say, The Sins. Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Hunter, rank 1. Throughout the wasteland in your travels you've encountered some strange creatures and phenomenon. Now you can use that experience to your advantage. You can see through a shape-shifting enemy's disguise easier than most, and some wasteland creatures that are a lower level will not attack you.